Morning, church. Father, we love you. And God, what an awesome responsibility it is to open up your word. But what an awesome privilege it is as a child of the Most High God to hear the very word come out of your mouth. So God, as we open up 1 Corinthians, we pray, God, have your way. Holy Spirit, speak in a way that each individual heart needs to hear this morning. Lord, help us to just hear what the Spirit's saying this morning. We thank you. I praise you for the tough passages and for the great passages. I praise you that I'm a child of God. I praise you that you love me enough to correct me when I'm wrong and, and to nurture me when I'm hurting. I thank you that we're your kids. And so, Father, do your thing this morning. We give you our heart and our attention, and we want to hear from you because you have the words of life. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And all God's kids said, amen. amen. So I read an article this week about parenting and they, what they considered the most important things to teach our children. And they listed some things. And tell me if you agree with these things that they listed. They listed purpose, faith, character, marriage, family, friends, community, health, and I think most important, time. And I got to thinking, you know, the relationship between a parent and a child is one of the most important things that we can do while here on planet Earth. Because unfortunately, some kids are left to navigate for themselves the tough decisions in life. And making the wrong decisions, obviously, they can learn lessons the hard way rather than learning them through us. And, you know, now that I'm on the other side in an empty nester, I realized what a precious gift my kids were. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> but being a grandparent is so awesome. I got to see my grandbabies for the first time in 10 months and fill them full of sugar and money and then go home. And it was awesome. But you might ask, how does this tie into our 1 Corinthians 4 study? Well, this is what Wearsby said. He said, Paul has already compared the local church to a family. But now the emphasis is more on the minister as a spiritual father. Keep that in the back of your mind as you open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 as we continue in that verse-by-verse -verse study. So we've been learning since the offset that the church, the, the church at Corinth had a number of spiritual problems. And I love that Paul over and over again reiterates, these are Christians, these are saints. And, and so when we read about their problems, we could say, Boy, that gives me hope, right? Last week, we learned about how if we follow Christ in this world, we're going to appear to be fools to the world for the sake of Christ. And so in this morning's passage, Paul, like a parent would be concerned, is concerned with this church's purpose and, and their faith and their character, their marriages, their family, their friends, their community, their health and their time. So if you have your sermon notes, Roman numeral one there on your chairs, Heed the warning. Heed the warning. If your Bibles are open, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, start at verse 14. Paul starts out by saying, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Notice Paul starts out by saying, I don't want to shame you. And this points back to what he said last week, 1 Corinthians 4.10. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. So Paul's saying, I don't write these things to shame you, but I need to correct you. G. Campbell Morgan said, though Paul used strong sarcasm, his purpose wasn't to make fun of these Christians. Rather, he wanted to shake them from their proud, self-willed thinking. You know, what would it take to shake these people awake and say, hey, you're going down the wrong path. You know, I hate to be corrected, but there's sometimes in life we need someone to just kind of take us by the collar and shake us awake to make us realizing we're harming ourselves. And some people hear these verses from Paul and think, man, this guy was harsh to these Christians. Man, he's really harsh, but, but here's the truth. You, you ever have your parents say, this is going to hurt me more and it's going to hurt you? By the way, I never believed that. 
I don't believe it hurt him more than it hurt me, but Paul is saying, you're my kids, and I love you. And so as a good parent, I'm going to tell you those things that are going to harm you. If your kid went to run in front of a semi-truck that's doing 40 down the road, and you didn't reach out and grab that kid, something's wrong with you as a parent. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son he receives. And so just as the Lord would correct us in Christ, so Paul is looking at these Christians saying, you are dabbling into things that are going to harm you. And I love you way too much to just sit back and watch it happen. So I'm going to give you a piece of advice for those of you who don't know me. For those of you who know me, know this already, but I'm going to give you a piece of advice. If you don't want biblical truth spoken into your situation, please don't come and ask my opinion. That's not funny because some people, they come and ask my opinion and I tell them the truth and they get mad. I had someone from a previous church call me a couple of weeks ago and I'm not going to tell you all the details because it was private. But he began telling me what had went wrong in his life in the last couple of years and how he got there. So he's telling me the whole sort of details. And again, I'm not going to tell you the details, but I started to share with him some biblical guidance. Some biblical guidance. After giving this guy what I know to be 100% biblical truth, I hurt his feelings. And I hurt him deeply, and I didn't mean to. But I, I wasn't nasty with him. I was loving on him, but I just told him what the Bible said. And I could hear a pause on the phone, and you could hear that he was hurt. And so I said these words to him, almost quote unquote. I wasn't trying to make you feel bad. But I want you to have a very clear conscience before the Lord when this is all said and done. And I want to make sure that you are right. You're saying you want to follow the Lord. So I want to make sure you have a clear conscience when this is over. Another pause. A long pause. To the point I said, are you still there? He responded with these words. I really appreciate that about you. It was one of those, well, do you want me to speak truth into your life? Or do you want me to make you feel good moments? He went on to say, and I always want the truth. There in your notes, as a spiritual parent, Paul loved these Christians, but he also had a responsibility to speak God's truth to them. He had a responsibility. You know, the gift of discernment is a tough gift to have. I'd rather almost have any gift than the gift of discernment. I say that in jest, kind of. But the gift of discernment is tough because if you know someone and you're looking at a situation and you have the discernment to say, if you keep heading down these tracks, you keep heading in the direction you're going, bad things are going to take place. Well, are you a fortune teller? No, but I have enough discernment to know what you're doing is wrong. And if they heed your advice, fantastic. And then you can walk away and you remain friends. But that almost never happens. Usually, when you give somebody biblical advice because of discernment, they get mad at you and maybe even stop talking to you for a time. And you go, hey, man, you asked. You asked. So please, don't ask my opinion if you don't want biblical truth. Then we can remain friends. But maybe you hear these Christians that say, don't judge me. You can't judge me. I mean, that, that ought to be written on everybody's bumper sticker, right? That is the favorite saying of Christians today. Don't judge me. Who are you to judge me? Paul said in Galatians 6.1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one, and catch this, in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If you are in a position spiritually over a person and you see them getting into something that's going to harm them, it's a thankless job. One that you will not be admired for, but you must correct. You must. But while correcting, here's a good litmus test for you. Keep in mind the words of Jesus. In Matthew 7, 4, Jesus said, How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, 
a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So what you don't want to do while living in a sinful situation is go to another Christian living in the same sinful situation and tell them how unrighteous they are being. So Paul says, hey, you may have 10,000 instructors. You may have 10,000 of them. And I looked it up in Strong's Concordance, and an instructor means a tutor or a guardian or a guide of boys. In Rome, an instructor was a trustworthy slave that basically, if you had a young boy who was in school, you'd have a trustworthy slave that would walk this boy to school and he'd look out after him when the parents weren't around and make sure he was doing all the right things and he'd supervise the child. So an instructor had a certain amount of say-so over the child's life, but not as much as the father, right? So notice Paul says, I have a right to tell you that you're wrong, because I begotten you, I have begotten you through the gospel of Christ. I brought you up. I, I started this church, and I led you to faith in Christ. And so I have a responsibility to tell you what's true. With that being said, you've got to remember, it's the Lord who draws. It's the Lord who saves. We don't save, we don't draw, none of us, including the Apostle Paul. But there in your notes, if you share the gospel with someone... And they get saved, even though others planted and watered and God gives the increase, you will probably feel like a spiritual parent to them. Now, this doesn't give you any special authority over their lives, but it does when you've watched someone go from being a pagan to being a saved saint, and then all of a sudden you see them getting into some dangerous theology or some dangerous things, it hurts your heart. And you should pray about it. You should make sure that you're clean before the Lord yourself. But then you've got to go and tell them, hey, what you're doing isn't right. All right, Roman numeral two. So Paul says, imitate a mature Christian. Look at verse 16. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. What a bold statement. How many of us would like to say that to the people under us spiritually? Imitate me. How many of us would say that? I mean, that terrifies me. That terrifies me even to go to my kids and say, hey, imitate my walk in Christ. Man, I'd rather say, hey, go imitate Billy Graham, right? Go imitate Charles Swindoll. Go imitate somebody mature in the faith. To say imitate me, to me, that is scary. But when you're bold enough to tell someone to follow your lead, you'd better make sure that you are following Jesus. Right? You'd better make sure of that. Paul said in Ephesians 5.1, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Be imitators. Some versions say be followers. Be followers. There in your notes, the English word mimic comes directly from the Greek word that is translated as imitators in Ephesians 5.1. So you may remember back in Acts chapter 11 that Barnabas went and brought Paul to Antioch, and they taught there for a full year at the church at Antioch. Acts 11.26 says, So it was for a full year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And catch this, and the disciples there were first called Christians at Antioch. So at that time, calling someone a Christian was an attempt at kind of cutting them down. It, it was kind of like a jeer, or it's kind of like, you know, teasing them. Calling someone a Christian was calling them little Christ. You are a little Christ. And in fact, James Boyce said by calling people Christians, they were actually calling them Christ ones. Christ ones. But what they meant as an insult, Christians all of a sudden caught on and said, I kind of like that. It, it tells us our mission statement right there. I'm a Christian. What is a Christian? I imitate Christ. Not that you're a little God, but you're a little Christ. You mimic Christ. 
you know, our world's full of imitators, right? I mean, it's just kind of built into our makeup to imitate. Children imitate their fathers. People imitate stars and athletes and all these different things. But here's the truth there in your notes. We will reflect the things, the people, and the culture we truly believe in, just as the moon reflects the sun. Live Science says the moon shines because its surface reflects light from the sun. And so how do you mimic someone else's behavior? We had someone else teaching Sunday school. We're kind of tag teaming. And, and I remember the first week he taught, he said, I'm going to try and mimic Rich's mannerisms. And I thought, the only way he can mimic my mannerisms is if he's watched me. So there in your notes, right? So as a child of God, who are we called to look like? Now, we could look at these you know, musicians, we could look at these athletes, we could look at these different people and the way they behave. And, you know, after all, they have, you know, MTV Cribs and they have this Rolls Royce and they have all these things. I want to mimic that person. But as Christ followers, the creator of the universe has begotten us as his children. And he says, mimic me. How do we learn to mimic God? Well, the same way my son or the same way the Sunday school teacher would mimic me, spend time, get to know him. How how does God behave? How does God talk? How does God act? What does he do? And the more I get to know, the more I can mimic him. Charles Spurgeon said, we were sent into the world for what? Is it not that we may keep in the mind of men God himself? that they're most anxious to forget? If we are imitators of God as dear children, then we will be compelled to recollect that there is a God, and they will see his character in us. He went on to say this, I heard of an atheist who said he could get over every argument for God except his godly mother. He could never give an answer for her. In the book of Genesis, we were originally made as image bearers. We were made in the image of God himself to to show the world his image. Now, of course, after Adam and Eve sinned, we lost that. But even as fallen men, there's still glimmers. I mean, we were talking about this last week. Think about the human eyeball and the brain that has to process what the eyeball sees in just one minute at a time. There's no scientist, there's no Bill Gates of the world who can mimic what the eyeball does. And they have spent all this time creating a computer to try to do what God created by a word from his mouth. There in your notes, so my resemblance to my heavenly father is more evident as I dedicate my time and my whole life to him and his purposes. So the only way you can imitate Jesus Christ is getting to know him personally, spending time with him, completely relying on him, and then you'll begin to resemble your king. Now, of course, we could look at Christian brothers and sisters who have gone before us in the faith, and we can learn some things from them, but you can't imitate Christ without knowing Christ. Later, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me just as I also imitate him. And and there's the truth. Imitate me as I imitate him. Philippians 3, 17, he says, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. So look around. If they behave like Christ, then follow them. If they do not behave like Christ, don't follow them. And and you could just imagine, as Paul was pastoring this church at Corinth, and he's showing them his example, he's living by the fruit of the Spirit, and he's showing them, then you can say, follow me as I follow Christ. Notice in verse 17, Paul sent Timothy to Corinth to remind these Christians what he was teaching everywhere. So, Timothy was not only a mouthpiece for Paul, but he was also kind of a troubleshooter. Hey, go there and find out what's going on. 
bring word back to me so we can correct this church. And remember Timothy, we first meet him in Acts chapter 16, and we're told in 2 Timothy that his mother and his grandmother were first converts of Paul and how he learned the scriptures from a young age and all that. And then he went on to pastor the church at Ephesus. And so now Paul's sending him, go to Corinth and tell them how I live. Tell them how I teach. Tell them who I am when no one's watching. How'd you like to tell your kids that? How'd you like to show your kids those secret places in your heart? I wouldn't. But Paul here sends Timothy to remind them everything that I taught, the way I lived, who I am, and how I teach other churches. There in your notes. Remind them of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Shows us that Paul was not asking more of the Christians at Corinth than what he expected from other believers. Now we don't have Paul with us today, but we certainly have his teaching. And we can certainly follow his example. And we can certainly follow the example of other godly leaders too to improve our own walks. So Roman numeral three, the sin of pride during Paul's absence. Look at verse 18. Now some of you are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Here's a great question. Shall I come to you with a rod? or in love in the spirit of gentleness? Do you want it the easy way, or you want it the hard way? That's a pretty good question. There were some, remember, that were in opposition to Paul's leadership, right? And, and they had this sin of pride, and they thought, Paul will never come back physically. We don't have to worry about him. He's not going to come take care of any business. And, and so they were so emboldened in their sin, because they don't think Paul's going to show up and take the rod to him. And, and some believe that Paul was afraid to go back. He won't come and face us. And, and by, by the way, we like Apollos better. Or by the way, we, we like Peter better. We like someone else better. So Paul's not going to correct us. And Paul's so patient with them. I love the way he asks us, hey, do you want this the easy way? Or do you want it the hard way? Because I can do both. There in your notes, church leaders are in a real battle with the world, the enemy, and those who seek the destruction of everything God has built in the local church. Now, like everything else in Christianity, there's two far extremes, right? We have some denominations who teach that the leader is beyond reproach. The leader's up here in his ivory tower, and we can't speak bad about him, we can't correct him, we can't do anything. He is, oh, after all, he's God's apostle and mouthpiece. Do not speak evil of that leader. But then you get into some circles of evangelical Christianity who have no respect at all for the office. And that's the key. It's the office. If God has called that man or woman into the office of leader, we respect the calling of God. And so here in our context, these prideful people, they think Paul's not going to come correct them. And I love how Paul says, if the Lord wills, I will come to you. If you read through his missionary journeys, I love how the Lord changes Paul's plans all the time. You know, Paul says, I'm going to do this, and then it changes. I'm going to do that. And so by this point, he says, okay, I get it. If the Lord wills, I'm coming to you. If the Lord wills. James warns against making plans against the Lord's plans, right? James 4.13 says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, Buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what's your life? Is it even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away? There in your notes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. And then notice he says, those of the word who are puffed up, but in power. Guzik said, those among the Corinthian Christians who loved high-sounding words and their successful image had their own word, but Paul had the true power of the gospel. 
there in your notes. The final test of wisdom is power. The word of the cross not only has the power to mentally illuminate, but it also has the power to morally save. We're going to come back to verse 20 in just a minute. Let's touch on 21 real quick because we're going to end on verse 20. So Paul says in 21, so what do you want? Again, the ball's in your court. You want it the easy way or the hard way? I probably would have chosen the hard way because I'm a contrarian at times. But So he's saying the rod, the shepherd's rod. Do you want me to come with the shepherd's rod or do you want me to come with love and patience? Spirit of gentleness. You see, what you've got to understand about the early church, we don't have this in our day and age, and that's, as we get into church correction, we're going to talk more about this. But in their day and age, there was no church hopping. You understand that? There was no, gee, I don't like the music there, or I don't like that pastor there, so I'm going to go to, you know, the church of what's happening now down the street. The church of Jesus Christ was the church. And, and they were all in one accord and broke bread together and all those things. They were a church. And so when Paul comes and says, do you want me to correct you? It wasn't like, well, I'm mad at Paul, so I'm going to go to Peter's church. That's not how any of that worked. But Paul, like any good leader, says, hey, would you like me to come in gently and show you your faults? Or you want me to come in and flip tables over, you filthy-hearted people? And I love that. And that's how it is with faithful parents, right? How many of us parents have gone into our kid's room and said, okay, Fess up, and this can go easy, but if you keep this up, it's not going to go well for you. Keep this disobedience up. Maybe it's just me. I was a rough parent, I guess. Don't ask Brandon when this is over. But Paul faced these challenges of ministry, and how do I confront sin and yet not go overboard? How, how do I... Stop from being too harsh. How do I love on these people while they're in open sin? How do I get people to completely sell out for the gospel of Christ? How can I do this? And and what Paul understood is no matter what my life and my example are to you, it still has to be the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. I can show you all day long how to put a nail through a two-by-four, but until you pick up that hammer, you won't do it yourselves. And so the statement there in 1 Corinthians 4.20 seems to disprove the New Age movement that words create somehow. We create reality with our words. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Wearsby said the arrogant Christians had no problem talking big, just the way a child would do. But they could not back up their talk with their walk. Their religion was in words only. Paul was prepared to talk, back up his talk with power of the Holy Spirit that revealed their sins in God's holiness. And, and so the same is true when we get saved. And we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks in Sunday school, so I thought it was really important. Let's discuss what it does look like when we get saved. Because so many people would say, hey, if you just say the sinner's prayer, hominis, dominus, you're saved, you're good, go on. It's a done deal. Others would say, like James would say, you show me your your works. I'll show you my works. I'll show you my faith through my works. I'll get it right one of these minutes. But anyway, so the same truth is, is for us as well. And I always go to Romans 10, 9, and 10. How do you get saved? Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Romans 10, 8. The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. So how do I get saved? Step one, there in your notes. A person hears the gospel. That is, he understands the message of the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the way, right? Because if the Holy Spirit doesn't give you utterance, hearing something means nothing. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, if the Holy Spirit does not clearly use the gospel and explain it to your heart, it means nothing. 
John 6, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless my Father, who sent me, draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So we need the Holy Spirit to explain to us what the gospel is, and we need the Father drawing us. If those two things don't happen, you can hear the gospel for 25 years, and it will mean nothing. So a person hears and understands the gospel that the Lord gave them and gives them understanding and draws them. And then, second part, Romans 10, 9. Here it is. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, so you confess Jesus as Lord, and then you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Step two, there in your notes. Because a person hears the gospel and realizes that they are a sinner in need of a Savior, they confess Jesus as Lord God. Okay, that's step two. You confess. But it doesn't end there because words don't create reality. Can I just tell you that? I can stand up here all day long and tell you I'm 6'5". I can stand up here all day long and tell you I'm in the best shape of my life. Neither one of those statements are true. I'm only 6'3". <laughs> Words don't create reality. There's more to it. So confession, yes, because, you know, you've seen some of these evangelical things that tell a person, just say the sinner's prayer. Great, you're saved. Go, be blessed, be warm, be fed. Next, come say the sinner's prayer. And they go, 5,000 people say that sinner's prayer, and maybe three of them are saved. And we give people a false sense of security just because you said the words does not make you saved. Because step three there in your notes, this verbal confession is then backed up by belief, which means, yes, to believe, but it also means to make a commitment. In the Greek, the word believe means you are placing your full weight of trust onto something. You guys all showed a little faith this morning. You want to know how? Look at what you're sitting on. That took faith. You had faith that that chair you're sitting on was not going to crumble when you put your derriere on it. That's faith. And that's what in the Greek it means. To have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ means I am taking all of my trust. I am fully taking all of the weight of my belief and trust and I'm putting it on what he did on the cross. He saved me. He died for me. He paid the purchase price. I did nothing. All I did was put my trust in that. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and then you place the weight of your faith on the cross and what he did, you will be saved. But it takes both. Just saying the words, I'm a Corvette. I'm a Corvette. You know, maybe the, the guys in white robes are coming to get me. You know, you can say whatever you want, but until you do that next step, and until you place your trust in Jesus Christ, it means nothing. Romans 10.10, 10, Paul goes on and explains it. For with the heart, one believes, one trusts unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It takes both. So let's conclude. Let me repeat Wiersbe's statement. Paul gave the Corinthian church the opportunity to set their household in order. Unfortunately, they did not immediately obey. You see, the Lord in his wisdom places different parts of the body where they are. And he's got a desire to fulfill it. But this church would not listen to their spiritual father. But this is the truth you need to remember there in your notes. There's not a human alive who is not under some kind of authority. Do you understand that? There's no one in all of earth that's above correction or that's not under someone else's authority. And a pastor teacher is simply called the shepherd of the flock. And it's a, it's a grave responsibility. The pastor's to feed and shepherd and protect his flock using the word of God in discernment and correction and love and nurturing to make sure false teachers don't come in, to make sure that the sheep are not going left and going right. And then we equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. 
As a leader of Christ's church, of course, we don't want to lord it over people like, respect me because I'm Pastor So-and-so. I'm Reverend Most High Bishop Richard Henry O'Toole III. Bow down and kiss my ring. No! No, listen, I'm just a beggar telling other beggars where to find bread. But my office, the office I've been called to is a lofty office. And sometimes, not sometimes, most of the times, I ask God why in the world he chose me. But he did. And so the office is something else. But we don't want to lord it over him. But we're overseers. We're overseers of God's kids. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter 5.2. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Catch this. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. And again, I can't wait. Go ahead in your own time. Read ahead to chapter 5 and chapter 6, but then don't stay home because you read it. (laughs) It it gets kind of tough, but the thing is, church correction is always about restoration. Always. It's the same picture you get when a sheep breaks its leg and the shepherd picks up that sheep and puts it on his shoulders to restore the leg. Right? There's two choices. Put the sheep down or restore. Mend the leg. And that's what church correction is all about. And you get so many people, you know, who do you think you are judging me? I'm not judging you. We're going to get into where Paul says, don't judge those who are outside. That's none of your business. But the ones who call themselves Christ followers, if there's open, here's the deal, open lifestyle sin, not oops, I blew it. Open lifestyle sin, you must correct. You must. Why? Healthy sheep begot healthy sheep. Sick sheep make sick sheep. You want a healthy church? Healthy sheep make healthy sheep. And that's why Paul is, hey, this is the way it's got to go. So pray for me (laughs) over the next couple of weeks because church correction is one of those things, boy, you just love to sweep it under the carpet, but you can't because you need healthy sheep. But this is God's word. And he had a purpose in it. And he wanted to love us and correct us. And like Paul would say, you want the easy way or you want the hard way? I think Jesus himself would ask that question. Hey, you want me to come to you gently and correct you? Or you want me to flip over some tables in this place? I want the gentleness, please. When I was younger, I wanted the flipped over tables, but I'm done with all that. <laughs> so I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back up. And in the back, like every week, we're going to have some elders and their wives who would love to pray with you and You know, truly, if there's ever any questions you have doctrinally or anything else about our church, hear me when I say I'm always open and I love to talk about the Lord anytime, any questions you have, okay? I don't want to argue, I'm past all that, but if you want to really come and just talk, I would love to open up a Bible and have coffee with you or whatever. And and by the way, I do like chocolate, just saying, but let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are a good shepherd. You are the good shepherd who loves his sheep. And you are not going to let us walk around lame and broken. Lord, you have come to give us abundant life. And so, Father, those areas in our life that we get behind or we fail, Lord, you're going to come to us and gently lift us up. And then when we don't listen, you're going to take out the rod. And so, Father, help us to hear your word Help us, Lord, to be imitators of Jesus Christ that a lost, dying, broken world can see there's a different way. And God, help us to be that example of you to these people who are literally dying without you. Lord, while we're here, help us to snatch one more out of the fires. And God, we just thank you that though we weren't perfect, we weren't even close, you chose us, Lord, to represent you and you've given us new life, and you saved us from our sin. Lord, we're just so thankful that if anyone would confess the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart, they will be saved. So God, thank you for all you do. We love you, Lord. Help us to worship you now. 
And we just give you this time in Jesus' name. And all. Thank you for listening, and we hope that you are blessed. If you'd like to find out more info about our church or any other resources like sermon notes or things like that, you can check out our website at livingfaithklamath.com. Make sure, if you haven't already, to subscribe or like us on whatever your favorite podcast app is. You'll find us at Living Faith Fellowship Klamath Falls. Again, be blessed. Be blessed.